Good morning, everybody. Today, oh wow, September 1st. Happy September to you. So we've got a question today from a member of the community. So user submitted question, member submitted question. It's from Clinton. Clinton, I told you eventually I'd get to your question. So here it is. Clinton has asked a, a good question previously. So he opens up with, hi, Pat, me again. I got a question regarding programming and your thoughts of writing workouts as rx on the whiteboard or should it be written in the context to what your majority to what the majority of your members can actually do so let's say you've got a box with 200 athletes 95% of them are beginner to intermediate athletes most of them cannot do muscle ups can't do chest to bar pull ups can't really move heavy loads etc they're just your average everyday person should workouts be written as rx every day on the whiteboard or written for the majority of your clientele? Great question. <sighs> so I've got, a, I've got, of course, several thoughts on the matter. Here's my quick synopsis and then we'll, then we'll dissect it or unpack it as they say. I can't stand that term. I don't think it matters whether you write them up as rx and it's potentially a little bit beyond the reach of what most of your members can do or I don't think it matters if you don't write it up rx and you post what would be considered a scaled or modified version and that is the workout of the day if it is where most of your individuals need to be and here's why I say it doesn't matter because I think the bigger issue behind this is the culture in the gym and what the ownership, uh, the leadership, I meant to say, the leadership and the head trainers have set as how people communicate, uh, the level of respect, the word choices, how they make the members feel. I think if that stuff is properly done, then whether or not the workout is written up as prescribed or not, sorts itself out to some degree. Okay, that might not always be the case. And Clinton, I'm also not implying that you don't have a fantastic culture at your gym. I don't know what your culture is like. These are just the things that popped into my mind. So, you know, let's say that the workout of the day is a workout that everybody knows, right? It's Fran. 2159 thrusters and pull-ups. And maybe a lot of people at this gym that Clinton mentioned, a 95-pound thruster for 45 repetitions Ugh, it's not going to go well. It's going to be a lot of modifications happening. And more likely another culprit is 21.59 of a chest, uh, excuse me, chin over bar pull up. So that's the workout of the day. You know, this question is, should I write that up as the workout of the day, knowing that it's out of the reach of 95% of my clients? Or should I write up some modification? The classic way to do it, I'm not saying it's the right way, but the classic way would be to write Fran up there as the workout of the day. And then maybe you have, um, you know, so I would say Rx, and then maybe the next one would be a reduction in repetitions. It's 15, 12, 9 thrusters and pull-ups. So we kept the movements the same, kept the loading the same, 95, 65, but we knocked it down to 15, 12, 9. That could be a modification or a scale. Then we could also play with the loading and the pull-up. Maybe another option or scale is 21, 15, 9 thruster goes down to 75 pounds for the men, 55 for women, and now for the pull-ups, we've got a choice of doing either a ring row or the appropriate band for a banded pull-up. And then we could play that same game, keep the thruster at 75, 55, keep the ring row banded pull-up, but instead of 21, 15, 9, we have a 15, 12, 9 reps option as well. So you could write up Fran, that's the workout of the day, that's the prescribed workout. And then you have these three different modifications that we just mentioned that would get fitness achieved when properly executed for most of your clients. Or you could write just so there's four things. There's Fran prescribed, Fran with, with reduced reps, and then we had the other two options which reduced the loading and the pull-ups. You could just write those up as option A, B, C, and D. That would be fine too. And you're saying the same thing. You're writing the same workouts on the board. The 
literally the only thing that you're modifying or is the sticky point. And the entire point of the question is whether having that RX version, that tougher version, you know, whatever you want to say, not necessarily tougher, but athletes haven't yet developed the capacity to do it. Does having that on the board create something positive in which people are trying to strive for or is it viewed as a negative because they look at that workout, they say, well, darn it, that's what we're quote unquote supposed to be doing today, but I'm not doing that workout. And why am I not doing it? Because I either can't move the thruster or I don't have the pull-ups, which could be encapsulated under, I'm not fit enough, I'm not good enough, it's out of reach. Now I'm demotivated. I think working out sucks. I don't want to be here. Blah, 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 you know, fill in the blank like that. I think that's the, the broader context of what we're talking about. So the question comes down to, inside the human mind of the athlete, when they look at that board, does seeing something that's a challenge that's a bit out of reach motivate them or ruin their day? I think that's the ultimate question, right? And I don't think there's one answer to that because no two people might feel the same about that, let alone no three, no 100 people, no 200 people. Now, yes, you could get a majority consensus. And if you realize that you took an honest poll, your 200 members, and they said, as a matter of fact, yeah, um, I feel deflated and, you know, bad when I see every day the RX workout is written up and I can't do it. It does not motivate me. I'm miserable. And that was 95% of your clientele replied honestly to that poll. I would say that's pretty powerful feedback and data. And I would be, you know, very much in support of then changing the wording, you know, used to describe the workouts or what you're writing on the board, etc. Because that would be tough to ignore. However, if I, in my ideal world, what the solution would be, because like I said, and I don't know what's happening at Clinton's gym, I truly believe that the, the owners, the leadership at the gym, and the trainers at the gym, they set the tone for the culture in that gym. And that is a huge responsibility. They not only have the responsibility of being squared away trainers, knowing all of their, you know, being technically proficient in what they're teaching, being competent, um, caring for the clients, improving their clean, et cetera, et cetera, time management, presence and attitude, demonstration. They not only have to do all of that, they're responsible for that, that's in their job description. But again, the gym culture falls on them as well. And that is equally as important as any of those other things that I just mentioned. And you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, how could the culture that's created be more important than being technically proficient as a trainer to make sure that your deadlift's safe? And I get that. But if you're, if, if you're this amazing, technically complicated, uh, proficient trainer, and the culture in your gym sucks, and it's negative, <clears throat> and it's a downer, and nobody likes being there, and nobody likes being around you, then you will have your amazing knowledge about the deadlift and no one to share it with because you're no fun to be around. So the culture and everything that you create is profoundly important. And best case scenario in the ideal world is trainers would let their athletes, their community, their members know that everybody's on a different path to fitness. Everybody's on a different journey to fitness and they're all at different stages. And just because you happen to be at a different stage than somebody else at the class, in no way, shape or form is a character flaw with you as a human being. You're just on a different step in the progression. That's all, you know? And so if Fran is written on the board and you're not quite there yet and you need to scale the pull-ups with a band, that's just getting you closer to obtaining your goal of being healthy and being fit. And it's not a, a mark against you at all. That, that is a very important, powerful, potent message that also, in my mind, transcends to a lot of areas in life outside of the gym as well. And I think it's mission critical 
for clients to understand that as much as it is for them to understand how to deadlift, how to air squat, how to eat properly, and all that good stuff. And, <clears throat> you know, there are some things that I can't talk about. I don't know a lot about colonizing Mars. Uh, I'm not a scientist nor an astronaut. However, when it comes to speaking with people, that is what I do for a living. You know, delivering messages, delivering content, and ideally uh, explaining things which could be potentially um, challenging to get your head around or whatnot, but in a way that's palatable and acceptable. That's what I do. And so I'm here to tell you that delivery matters. Word choice matters. Your body language matters. And then your clients are going to see are you also living it? Or are you just saying it with this little pep talk that you gave, you know, Bobby in the corner, you know, to get his head back in the class, and then you go back off, and you're not concerned with the average Joe. You're all goo goo gaga about the trainers and the the uh, you know the competition class that's going on in the corner, and they're the cool people and they get your full attention and they you're just that's the amazing thing. And you go back and you deal with Bobby in the regular class, blah blah blah. Hey Bobby, you got it. They're gonna see right through that. And that's going to be just a, a load of manure that nobody's going to appreciate. So words matter, delivery matters, integrity matters, walking the walk, talking the talk. It, it, it all matters and it all adds up and it all culminates in whatever is that culture and that heartbeat in your gym. And that's the amazing thing about CrossFit also is... You know, it's not a franchise. You know, it's an affiliate. So this is all up to you. You can have whatever culture and whatever tone you want in your gym. And and neither one's right or wrong. It's just up to you. But bear in mind, think through what the end result is going to be. You know, our... Uh, some gyms just have that vibe when they walk in, that it's you know, a bit of an older crowd. Some gyms have that vibe when you walk in that they're all about competition. Some gyms have that vibe when you walk in that every day is heavy. Some days, some boxes are just, you know, you walk in and it's pounding death metal and, uh, or rap, and the, the trainer, when he welcomes you for your first class, has dropped seven F-bombs in the first sentence. Uh, another one doesn't swear at all. None of those are right, and none of those are wrong. But all of them affect the culture in your gym, affect the perception of your clients. They, they affect everything. So whatever it is that you, ch you choose, I don't care which one you choose, but I'm just saying choose it with your eyes wide open and think all the way down the end of the road as to how the end user, your client, your livelihood is receiving this message that you're putting out. And you're putting out a message whether you realize it with every social media post, with every way that you welcome a new client, with the way that you teach the air squat, when the way that somebody approaches you with a problem. I mean, with, with everything that you do, with every interaction that you have, from the 5 a.m. class to the last class of the day, it all matters and comes into how your gym, your community, and your culture is. So should you call it RX, scaled, modified? Should you call it options for workouts, whatever it is? At the end of the day, I don't think it matters if you have created the appropriate culture there. But as I said previously, if you get some no kidding, undeniable data that certain wording is not working out for your clientele, then, then I would absolutely address that. You know, the interesting thing is, I also have to realize that while I don't think scaling is a bad word at all, it's not a bad word. Scaling is a tool, a wonderful, beautiful, amazing, useful tool that helps you achieve goals. Scaling's great. So I don't see that as a bad word in any way, shape, or form, and I will scale the heck out of a workout in a moment not feel bad about it at all. However, I would be lying to you if I said I always felt that way. It took me a while to pull my head out of my rectum and realize that scaling was cool. Uh, because especially back in the day, 
you know, when I first got out of the military and, you know, tough as nails and blah, 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 chip in my shoulder, you know, I can do anything, I'm not going to scale anything, I'm just an idiot, quite frankly, and that's just, a, I mean, I, looking back at myself, I wish I could just wring my own neck. So it took me a while to realize that if I really did want to get fitter, faster, and stronger, and better, that, that scaling was the way. And it was a fantastic thing. And it's how goals are achieved. So I would work very hard on, on communicating that to, to members, to clients, uh, to whoever it happens to be. And, you know, at Lynchpin, on the private track each day, I give some goal times or percentages if it's a lifting day or rounds if it's an AMRAP. And I give two. And the topic that we're talking about today, for a while, I was concerned as to whether or not it was being received properly at Lynchpin because I give what I believe, let's say it's a time to work out, you know, it's for time. I get the range that I think most people will fall into, whether you've been doing CrossFit one year or five years, where most people will fall. And I call that the more likely time because that's exactly what it is. It's the more likely time. And then there's a very lofty goal for that workout, a fast time scorching time. It's humanly possible, but it's it's ambitious, you know, and that's called the super fitness robot time. And we had those for quite some time. And then I was like, well, I wonder if I messed up when I did that because super fitness robot, I mean, that's just a cool flashy title, right? Who doesn't want to be a super fitness robot? And that's the time you want to go after. And then what's the other time? Wah, wah, wah. More likely. That's not a very flashy name, right? But yet, that's where most people are going to be in the non-flashy ones. So I was like, oh man, I think I walked into my own trap. I think I messed that up. I think I should have, you know, made the more likely one some flashy, whatever it happened to be, and, and the other one, whoever, you know, name it, whatever it happens to be. So I actually did what I just recommended. I took a poll uh, inside the the private track and was like look we can change this like I don't want you know this was not my intent when I did it I was just putting out in a very factual manner like this is the more likely time and if you do get this other time wow I mean that is a heck of an accomplishment and it was very cool I apparently we have created a good culture because no one saw the phrase more likely as a negative or as a put down or as whatever they just saw it for what it was. It was descriptive, just completely descriptive in nature. They're like, no, 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 don't change it. That's exactly what it is. It's the more likely time, and we're good with that. That's, you know, that's great. And if every now and then we obtain this lofty goal, like, it should feel like we achieve this prize, this random hard-to-get prize every now and then. But that's not normal. That's not common. This is what we're doing. We're going after the more likely time or the more likely number of rounds on Cindy. That's great. Keep it. So that, so that made me happy, but I will tell you that had if everybody had said, no, we don't like it, I would have changed it. I absolutely would have. But luckily, I think we've done a, a decent job, you know, again, practicing what we preach, which is scaling is cool. Remove your ego and make the appropriate decisions that you need to advance yourself forward. That's cool. That's fantastic. And that would be my... Uh, desire or advice in in answering the question from Clinton. So that's it. I hope everybody had a a fantastic weekend. I guess I guess yesterday was Monday. So I hope you had a great Monday. <laughs> and we'll talk again later and enjoy test 11 today, Lynchman test 11. And it's nice cuz it loops into this topic. I will absolutely be scaling or modifying or whatever you want to call it, linchpin test 11, and I will have no guilt about doing that in any way, shape, or form. Have a great day, and we'll talk later.